The Crane Game Written by Truly Wicked and read by Eleanor Elizabeth Summary Every Valentine's Day found Harry running from origami cranes. This year, he has finally hit his limit, and if Malfoy doesn't quit, he's leaving Hogwarts. There were only two seemingly innocuous things in this world that could send Harry Potter running away like a frightened deer at this time of year. The first was any being dressed like Cupid, that might even seem to be heading his way with a letter. That had its roots in his second year at Hogwarts, and everyone understood exactly why he wished to avoid a repeat. The other was a small, folded, flapping paper bird that had a tendency to flutter into his office or classroom once or twice a day for seven days, starting on the 7th of February. It started the first year he agreed to accept the post of Professor for Defence Against the Dark Arts at Hogwarts, at the surprising young age of 21, and had continued to happen in the seven years since. It had become something that was a bit of a running joke. A six-foot-tall adult man who defeated the most feared dark wizard of their time, running like a scared little girl from an origami crane that was flapping after him for all it's worth. Of course, if anyone could ever see what was on the inside of the paper crane, they might better understand why Harry ran like the hounds of hell were on his heels. Harry ducked and weaved through the student exodus after classes, not sure if he wanted to hex someone when they noticed that the students only parted after he passed, making way for the flapping paper crane that much easier than his. The muffled laughter also irked him heavily. It was only during this week that the tensions that he gave reached snake proportions, but it didn't seem to deter the students from laughing at him. If they weren't so embarrassing and somewhat obscene, he'd be tempted to post the notes for everyone to gawk at so they'd understand why he ran from them. Not that it ever did any good. For every crane he managed to avoid, ten more showed up in his private quarters. He reached his sanctuary, the corridor of the Room of Requirement, paused long enough that the crane caught up and snatched the blasted thing out of the air, then paced to get the room to open for him. He shut the door with a quiet snap, and before he could talk himself out of it, unfolded the crane and took a look at the drawing and short note inside. His cheeks flushed bright red, and he crumpled the paper into a ball. The only things positive he could ever say about these fucking notes was that, in the years since the very first paper crane was blown his way, the sender had improved his artistic skills greatly. From stick figures throwing circles standing as rocks at a badly drawn representation of him to... this. He glanced back down at the crumpled paper. There, now hidden from view, was a drawing of himself bent over a log in some forest, with fucking Malfoy pounding into him from behind. Beside it was a scripted note. I've got the hot dog, and you've got the buns, so baby, let's cook out, and I'll come in. The problem was, it was actually well drawn, to the point that, if it were less explicit, you could hang the damn thing on a wall proudly. As it was, however, Harry drew his wand and pointed it at the paper. Incendio! He watched as the paper burst into flames, taking the obscene image with it. The next hour or so was spent sending various curses and spells at a dummy spelled to look like one Draco pain in the arse Malfoy. He could handle the other man with grace and patience during the rest of the year. Truth be told, during the rest of the year, Draco wasn't that bad. Still snarky, but Harry had found he'd grown to enjoy someone who could be so sneakily clever. Still arrogant, but tolerably so, considering that he'd shifted from being arrogant in his place in society to his skills, and Harry had to admit, Draco was good at what he did, and still able to skim out of trouble with ease. He was also quieter, calmer, and his tenure as Snape's apprentice had given him a much-needed dose of stability and maturity. Any other time of year, Draco was a good conversationalist, shockingly good at simple flirting, though that discomforted Harry, he also found it somewhat flattering, and at his worst tended to stand just a little bit too close, so that Harry could feel the heat of the blonde's body and occasionally brushed up against him in ways that weren't quite kosher. That was any other time of the year. The week before Valentine's Day, however, some perverted demon seemed to take over, and Malfoy got downright obnoxious in his flirting, and then sent these notes once or twice a day, Ten times if Harry managed to avoid one. 
always of himself and Harry in some sort of intimate encounter, and always with a dirty note beside it. It was maddening, insulting, and Harry was man enough to admit it was disappointing. Any other time of year, Harry found himself contemplating what it might be like if he took Malfoy up on one of his simple flirts, but by the time he managed to work himself up to do more than contemplate, the 7th of February rolled around and he received a perverted drawing. It made him think that Malfoy was just playing a game with him, just another way of getting even with Potty for what went on in their 5th and 6th years. Then, after the 14th, he'd revert to his previous manner and it would take a solid six months for Harry to start contemplating again. He just didn't get it. If Malfoy was at all serious, why would he send such obscene notes with what were the worst pickup lines Harry had ever heard in his life? Merlin, Valentine's Day was supposed to be more about love than sex, wasn't it? So why did Malfoy insist on the perverted drawings and notes? Draco Malfoy hissed in frustration as Potter ran away from yet another of his notes. He'd been after the stubborn man for years, and though he tried to move on after ample evidence the brunette wasn't interested, it just wasn't possible. Every attempt failed miserably, and he was forever comparing everything others did to what and how Potter did things. Of course his attempts to get Potter weren't going so well either. He tried being subtle and slow standing too close, speaking too huskily and with slight innuendo, and just basically conveying his interest in small ways throughout the year. But Potter never said or did anything to indicate he even registered the subtle interest showed. So Draco used the excuse of the extreme shows of affection and lust that Valentine's Day seemed to require to send blatant I want you damn it messages to Potter, who literally ran away from them. What else could he do? Draco muttered vile curses and headed back to his chamber to draw another message. Perhaps one would be better received if he showed Harry on the receiving end of pleasure, instead of Draco appearing to take pleasure from him. Harry felt his face flame hot as he stared at today's crane message. He was laid out on a table with Malfoy alternatively licking his nipples and torso after dribbling some liquid all over it and sucking him off. The note scrawled in the margin today read, Baby, you're so fine. I want to pour milk all over you and make you part of my complete breakfast. Once again, he crumpled up the note and set it ablaze, his face still red as a lobster and his body, ignoring the protests of his mind, uncomfortably hard. He got up to head to his chambers for an ice-cold shower, cursing the talented pervert the entire way. The next crane actually found him as he was stepping out of the next day's cold shower, and he snatched the madly flapping folding paper from the air and opened it, damn near choking on air when he saw the drawing within. Following pattern, it was him and Malfoy, completely naked, both aroused. This time, the setting was the familiar mermaid that decorated the prefect's bathroom, and Malfoy had him sitting on the edge of the pool-sized tub while the blonde stood within the shallows. Harry swallowed thickly as he watched the sketchy Draco press his cock against the sketched Harry and rub them together as steam billowed and the water frothed. His body once again began to ignore his mind's emphatic statements that this was nasty and dirty and not at all something that he should like. Despite the cold shower having just ended, his penis was tenting in the towel slung around his waist. As per usual, there was a horrid pickup line. Can I turn you on like a faucet? Set to hot? He slammed the drawing down onto the bathroom counter and stalked into his bedroom to spell some clothes on, thankful that robes were handy for hiding things like an excited libido. He then stormed from his room and went up to the headmistress's office. He barked out the password. Hippogriff feathers. And stepped inside, much to McGonagall's surprise. Professor Potter, is there something I can help you with? As a matter of fact, headmistress, yes, there is. Can you get Malfoy to stop sending me these bloody obscene notes every bleeding Valentine's week? If I get one more, just one more bad pickup line next to a pornographic drawing from him, I will leave the school. I quite honestly can't take it anymore. He slumped into the squashy chair before her desk with a harassed sigh at her shocked expression. (sighs) Minerva, it's driving me balmy. 
I don't know why he does it, but every year since I took the DADA post, it's flapping paper cranes with perverted drawings inside them twice a day for seven days in February. Believe me when I say you don't wish to know exactly what those drawings contain. The headmistress took in the tired and vaguely disappointed expression on the 28-year-old professor and nodded. I will speak with Mr. Malfoy, Harry. I give my word. He gave her a wry smile. Thank you. Minerva knocked perfunctorily before she stepped into Draco Malfoy's chambers, prompting a blonde brow to raise curiously. Headmistress McGonagall, to what do I owe this pleasure? Your harassment of Professor Potter. It has to stop, Mr. Malfoy. He's threatened to leave the school should he receive... How did he put it? Oh yes, one more bad pickup line next to a pornographic drawing from you. Draco froze, a cloud of depression already seeming to form over him, as he realised Harry was that disgusted with him. Well, of course he is. Perfect bloody Saint Potter would never fall prey to the advances of a former Death Eater, now would he? Minerva sighed and went to tap Draco on the back of the head, drawing a shocked grey glance. You shoot yourself in the foot every year, Mr. Malfoy. Harry is not precisely used to the honest, amorous attention of others, not from anyone who wants him and not the man who lived twice. It takes him nearly a year to decide if you're serious, and then you ruin it by sending him things like... She swept the drawing Draco had just finished, her cheeks going red at the image of Draco tied to a bed with Harry riding him. This. He thinks you're mocking him. I understand that you've never had any sort of experience with normal courting, but you would be better served by taking a softer approach that lays your heart on the line. He paled and she chuckled. Yes, I know. Perish the thought that you make yourself vulnerable to hurt. Yet you expect Harry to make himself vulnerable to you. No one has ever treasured Harry. Ever made him feel like he's treasured, not even his friends. He has always been used in one way or another, and your notes only make him feel as if you view him as an object to be used as well. Show him that's not the case, and you may very well get precisely what you desire. In any case, I am quite fed up with you dancing around each other. So either win him the right way, Draco, or cease trying altogether. Her piece said she clipped out of the room, leaving Draco there to contemplate. He looked at the most recent drawing, then flicked it into the fire before drawing another parchment out and starting a new, different scene. Different from any thus far sent. Perhaps McGonagall was correct, and it was time to put an end to this ridiculous dance. Harry sighed as a crane flapped into his room on Valentine's Day. He'd had two days of peace, and thought that Draco had finally given up on tormenting him. Apparently he was wrong. He watched with trepidation as the larger-than-usual crane lit on his reading table. He picked the crane up and set about unfolding it, not really certain why he did, as he knew what would greet him. He should have just thrown it in the fire, but he didn't. A gasp parted his lips as he saw what lay on the paper this time. No pornographic image, nor was there any hint of a horrible pickup line. What greeted him was a beautifully rendered sketch of a dragon curled protectively around a drawn version of him. The dragon would occasionally nuzzle Sketch Harry, who looked more than content to be in the coils of this dragon affectionately. After a few moments, the dragon shifted and became Draco, who still held Harry protectively, only in his arms this time. The elegant hand rose and brushed the dark hair away from Sketch Harry's face, almost hesitantly, as if afraid he'd disappear like a soap bubble as soon as touched. The look on Draco's face was one of aching tenderness as he looked down on Harry, then brushed his lips over the lightning bolt scar. Harry felt his heart clench in longing for such tenderness as his gaze dropped to the block of writing beneath the picture. Harry, I do hope you don't mind me using your given name, but Potter is too cold for this letter. It was brought to my attention that my previous attempts at convincing you to give me a chance were ill-conceived. The brunette snorted at that understatement, but continued reading, fascinated and hoping that Draco was going to offer a good enough explanation, 
or at least give him a good enough reason to take a risk. I'll apologise if you want me to, but I can't help but want you. You are rather irritatingly attractive, you know. But I don't just want you in my bed, Harry. It's been seven years since you came to teach here, and in those seven I have not even looked at another person as I do you. I can't bring myself to do so, and believe me, I've tried. It would be so much easier if all I wanted from you was a few fantastic shags, then I could seduce you and move on. But I don't just want your body. I don't just want you in my bed. I want you. All of you. I want the noble, stupidly heroic Gryffindor, who was fool enough to take on the evilest credence our world has ever seen. I want the sneaky, clever, almost Slytherin, who managed to steal my family's wands from my keeping. I want the shy, stammering, blushing, clueless man who doesn't know how to take a compliment, or even when one's been given. I want the bold, smirking bastard who can look me in the eye and tell me just what he thinks of my pure blood status and riches, which isn't much, apparently. I want the crazy, half-cocked, impulsive man who makes the impossible possible. I want the cautious, hesitant creature who still can't stand the dark. Don't think I haven't noticed the light that always burns behind your door, and in your window every night, Harry, because I have. I want the tender-hearted fool who cried for a crazy old house elf, and I want the hot-tempered man who had the balls to use the crucio on Bellatrix. I want you, Harry. All of you. Not just the parts you share with the world, but every secret bit of yourself that you hide away. I want to hold them to me, and hoard them away, and destroy anyone else who might try to take a peek. You haunt my dreams, both waking and sleeping. I swear every time I close my eyes I see yours, very nearly glowing with the life and emotion you hold out for everyone to see. I hate that you know, that you give so much of yourself and get so little in return. I want to march up to the people who dare to ignore a kindness from you, and demand they thank you. Demand they give you your proper due. Not that any but a Malfoy could ever truly give you all you deserve, but they should at least endeavour to try. I see you in every bloody thing. Every time I turn a corner I see something that reminds me of you. I am forever comparing others to you and finding them distinctly lacking. Not to say that you don't have faults. You do. You absolutely do. And I'm just as fucking enamoured of them as I am of your virtues, Cersei, save me. Damn you, Harry. You've made me fall in love with you and you don't even see it. You're all I think about. All I can see, taste, hear. You're in my bloody throat. And I'm drowning in you. I'm drowning in you. Won't you save me? I'll be waiting at the Quidditch pitch until midnight, Harry. If you want to give it a go, want to see if I'm worth a risk. If not, if you don't even find me slightly interesting or worth a go, I'll never send you another crane. And I'll even stop flirting with you the rest of the year. You'll be well and truly free of me. The quaffle is in your hands, Harry. It's up to you what you do with it. Most sincerely, Draco dare me for a lovesick fool, Malfoy. Harry couldn't help but chuckle. The letter was pure Draco Malfoy, arrogant and somewhat bad-tempered, yet soft in a uniquely Draco way. His lips curved up and his fingers traced over the moving sketch in wonder. In his hands, he held something that could utterly humiliate Draco if he was so inclined. Draco was laying himself vulnerable in Harry's hands, and nothing could have proven more just how serious Draco's intentions were, despite the previous notes. The only question was if Harry was willing to risk the blonde changing his mind. He glanced down at the drawing again, seeing himself held as if precious in Draco's arms, and found his decision made for him. He pulled on his heavy winter cloak, 
and headed out onto the quidditch pitch. He paused in the shadow of the stands, still hidden from the blonde's gaze as he watched Draco pace the area that appeared to be under a warming charm, with a small picnic laid out. Every once in a while, Malfoy would glance nervously up at the moon, then down at a pocket watch before resuming his pacing. The further evidence of Draco's honest intent soothed the jumping in his stomach, and he walked out of the shadows. Draco. The blonde spun and stared for a minute at the way the moonlight shone down on the brunette, gilding him in silver light. Then he shook himself out of his idiotic stupor. Harry. You came. Harry walked closer, until he was inside the warm, charmed area, and could move his cloak off his shoulders. I did. He stood, shifting uncertainly. Now that he was here, what should he do? Draco solved that problem by stepping closer, flags of colour riding high on his cheeks. Does that mean you... want to try? Harry met the cool grey eyes. I liked what I saw in that drawing. I liked seeing you. Seeing what the letter said you feel for me. I don't... I don't really know if I can return them, but I think I could. In time. So, yes, I want to try. If you can rein in that pornographic art streak. He frowned at the blonde. Draco pouted playfully. Oi. It's erotica, not pornography. I just get... impatient, as you well know. I kept waiting for you to pick up on the small signals, but you never did, so I... He shrugged. Decided to be a perverted bastard. Harry drooled incredulously. Well, I thought you needed a bigger hint. I'm not exactly well-versed in fluffy romance, you know. Funny. You pulled it off wonderfully with the letter. Harry moved to stand in front of Draco, barely an inch separating their chests. And this little picnic seems rather romantic to me. Good, because I'll have you know I spent a solid hour reading for something to do that wasn't positively girly. Draco leaned closer until their noses nearly touched. Harry. Mm. Will you be my... Dear Merlin, I can't believe I'm about to use the asinine term, but... Will you be my boyfriend? Harry's lips curved in amusement and the stirrings of affection. Yes. And Harry... Yes. May I kiss you? I've been wanting to for a long time now. Harry's answer was to press his mouth to Draco's, a small smile still on his lips as the blonde lifted those elegant hands to cradle his head as he took control of the long, slow, shallow kiss. Just taking a taste to seal the new relationship for now. There would be hotter, deeper kisses later. He pulled back and gave Harry a soft, rare smile. Join me for chocolate-covered strawberries in the moonlight. Harry licked his lips and grinned. I'd love to. The next year rolled around, and much to the disappointment of the students and several staff members, Harry no longer ran from the paper cranes that fluttered into his office not just on the week of Valentine's Day, but randomly throughout the year. Instead, he looked up and smiled before letting the origami cranes land in the palm of his hand. The reactions he had when reading whatever was held within the cranes was varied. Sometimes it would be a soft smile, sometimes a laugh, and sometimes he'd blush and stuff the note in a drawer. Every time, though, he'd always make a crane of his own and send it back to his boyfriend who never failed to smirk like he owned the world when his Harry continued to play the crane game with him. Hey there guys, gals, and non-binary pals. It's Elena, and I hope you guys are having a lovely day today. Uh, 
what do you guys think? Did you enjoy the Valentine's Day special and our very, very special guest? Um, can you believe this actually happened? I got to do a collab with Mika, which was so cool and so fun and we had a really great time and I was so excited, like, getting a message from somebody who you just, like, really, really respect and have loved the work of and was somebody that you were listening to do this before you even considered thinking about doing it yourself was I yeah I can as you can imagine I got a little bit <laughs> had a little fangirl moment at home when I read that message of them being like hey do you want to collab um and I was so excited to do this he is so cool by the way if you haven't listened to any of his work please do I will leave it all in the description and like you will find all the links to his channel and stuff we also did another video on his channel so go check that out uh, he did all the dialogue for this and I did the narration and on his channel he did the dialogue do the narration and I'll be doing the dialogue I'm so excited guys <laughs> this is so cool um so yes please go check that out check him out please send him lots of love um because he's so nice and was very chill about the fact that i was like a little lost i don't know i feel like i was playing it pretty cool i don't know if anyone could tell that i didn't know what i was doing he also did all the editing on this as well which is great because i really suck at editing um not sure if you can tell from my normal videos um and he's really good at it so this was really really fun and cool this was also my first experience recording with like anyone else with me at the time we were doing this on call and i've never done that probably because i get like really nervous in front of other people and having them hear me as i do this but you know he made me feel so like at ease and we had a really great time and we talked a lot and yeah he's just like the coolest nicest person ever so please please go check out his channel okay i'm gonna stop rambling because i have like been re and re-recording this outro because i just keep going into long rambles about this but i hope you guys are all doing well um please let me know what you thought of the fic in the comments i know i haven't done really like any dry before but uh it's what i spend most of my time reading at the moment so i would like to do more if you guys like actually like like it and are interested um this is also you know a rated mature fic which i've only ever done one of before look at me like branching out <laughs> i hope you guys liked it please tell me what you thought in the comments down below be sure to like the video you know if you liked it and to boost my serotonin levels you can also subscribe if you want to be notified whenever i make new videos but until i see you again be sure to practice some self-care. Be sure that you are going to bed on time, that you are getting your five a day, don't forget to brush your teeth, and please, for the love of all that is holy, drink some water, you dehydrated little prunes. I know you haven't been doing it, so get on board. And yes, that is a threat, and I will catch you guys laters.